Our presentation this morning has kind of an interesting title, doesn't it? Discover how to get and to remain what? Undeceived. And that's going to be the topic of our presentation this morning. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right in to how to get and to remain undeceived. Father, we pause here just a, a moment on this special Sabbath morning. And our hearts are thrilled, Father, as we consider that this is the first of what will prove to be many comings together for this new church plant. And Father, we are thrilled about those that have come and those that are, are looking and those that are investigating and those that are wondering about Bible truth. And today, Father, we are dealing, as you know, with a very important topic, how to stay and to get undeceived. And Father, deception abounds in these last days. And that's no mystery to you. But Father, we pray that today you would give us practical, tangible, implementable steps so that we will know this is how I can be sure that I'm not being deceived. This is how I can be sure that I can know that I am standing on your word and your will and your plan. Father, be with us now. As we open your words, we're asking again that you'll open our hearts. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Well, I hope everyone has a study guide. It's yellow today. And take that study guide out. If you need a study guide, you could raise your hand. We could get our ushers to get you one. There's a couple that need study guides, quite a few actually. So maybe our ushers would like to run out. Thank you, Michael. That's very gracious of you. And notice there, the first three words of our study guide, what do they say? Deception is what? Dangerous. Deception is dangerous. You've heard that saying, ignorance is bliss. But this is not the case. Ignorance is not bliss at all, especially when it comes to eternal truths and eternal realities. If we think we're going the right way, but in fact we're going the wrong way, at the end of the day we're going to discover that deception is in fact very dangerous. Notice it goes on to say, unfortunately deception can also be difficult to what? Detect. Of course, it must be difficult to detect. If it wasn't difficult to detect, it wouldn't be deception at all. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Deception apes truth and remains as close as possible to truth. It is close enough to be convincing, but off enough to be wrong. This is what makes deception so very what? dangerous. This lesson deals with the essence of deception, but more than the essence of deception, it deals with the great cure for deception. These are both topics that we have already addressed somewhat, and we're going to go into more detail in this lesson. Let's begin by defining, def, uh, by defining the essence of deception. What is deception? Here it is. The definition of deceit, you can write that in there on your study guide. Of course, you're not going to be, get, be able to get all of it probably, but you can get the basic thrust of it. The first dictionary definition is this. Any declaration, artifice, or practice which misleads another or causes him to believe what is what? False. So it's any declaration, any statement, anything that is done to mislead another and cause them to believe as true what is really false. Number two. Second definition of deception or deceit. The leading of another person to believe what is false or not to believe what is true and thus to ensnare him. So the idea of deception is that when we begin to think what is true is really what is actually in reality false. Now, we, we described the other day that the essence of deception is that you are unaware you are being deceived. Remember that? Because deceived people do not think of themselves as deceived. And you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, I'm just glad I'm not deceived. The only problem is, is that that is exactly how what? Deceived people think. Nobody believes that they're being deceived because if you know that you're being deceived, by the definition, you are not being what? Deceived. And so the idea is that you think you're going down the right path, but in reality, you're going down the what? The wrong path. That's exactly right. Okay. There are three categories of deception. The first is intentional deception. That is to say that there are people who are out there intentionally deceiving others. 
They know that they're being deceptive. They are purposefully, intentionally, volitionally seeking to lead others astray. Of course, this would be the kind of deception that Satan himself employs. He is purposefully seeking to lead others astray and into the wrong path. But there is a second kind of deception, and that is unintentional deception. This is when someone thinks that they're giving you the goods, but when in reality they're not. They may not even know that what they believe is wrong. Not at all. In fact, I sometimes think of this when I see those faithful uh, Mormon missionaries, you know, riding around on their bikes dutifully, industriously, going out and trying to find Bible studies. Most of those people, I imagine, believe that they are telling what they think is true. I don't believe that those young boys, most of them, probably very few of them believe that they're going out to lead somebody astray. No, 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 no. So they would be unintentionally leading others astray if what they say is not traceable to what the Bible teaches. Can you say amen to that? Of course, we're not here picking on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Uh, I myself am a Latter-day Saint. Yes, you are. Are you, are you comfortable with that? I meet my friends the Jehovah's Witnesses and I say, oh, you're a Jehovah's Witness. Don't worry, I'm a witness for Jehovah too. <laughs> I witness for Jehovah and I meet them. You know, they say, I'm a Mormon. I say, hey, great. You know, we're going to get along wonderful because you're a Latter-day Saint and I'm a Latter-day Saint. I too believe that God is calling people to be saints in the last days. I meet a Baptist and I say, oh, you're a Baptist. I too am a Baptist because I believe in baptism by immersion. I meet a Methodist. I say, oh, you're a Methodist. I too am a Methodist because I love John and Charles Wesley and I believe that we should be living holy lives. We should be looking to build bridges where we can. Can you say Amen. And so the vast majority of people do not believe that they are intentionally leading someone to believe what is false, okay? That's unintentional deception. In some ways, that's even worse and more dangerous, but there is a third kind, and that is what? Self-deception. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So you have intentional deception, unintentional deception, and self-deception. We're on page two of your study guide. Now open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we spent some time here last night, and I want you to notice something very interesting. Matthew in the 24th chapter, first book of the New Testament. We've given you all of the verses here. It says at the top of the study guide, according to Jesus, deception will be rampant in the last days. That's exactly right, the last days. That is, the days just before His, guess what? Return. Consider, for example, the following text. And we're there in Matthew chapter 24. And notice with me beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said, Do you not see all of these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice the very first words out of Jesus' mouth as the disciples were inquiring about the end of the world. Verse 4. First thing Jesus says, Take heed that no one, what? Deceives, Deceives you. That's the very first thing he said. Be careful that no one deceives you. Now think about that for just a moment. They're saying, hey, tell us about the end of the world. What's the end of the world going to be like? I mean, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus says, be careful that no one deceives you. Now, to me, that, that communicates to me that Jesus believed that there was a very real chance, a very real possibility of deception in the last days. Yes or no? Okay, so just imagine you go up to a house and there's a fence there and there's a sign on that fence that says, beware of dog. Now, whenever I see that sign, I'm under the impression, I'm under the general impression that there is a dog on the other side of that fence that is probably not a chihuahua. Are you with me? Right? Because even if a chihuahua was ferocious, even if a chihuahua was mean, it would come up and do its little yippity yap thing and you just drop kick it into the next yard, right? <laughs> so my understanding is, is that when it says beware of dog, it means there's a Doberman pincer over there, or there's a Rottweiler over there, or there's a pit bull over there. Something is over on the other side of that fence that you should be aware of. In other words, that sign indicates a real danger. It indicates a what, everyone? A real danger. So when Jesus says, take heed, or beware, or be careful that no one deceives you, Jesus wasn't just saying something for the sake of saying it. He was saying, listen, this is a very real concern. The first words out of my mouth in answer to your question are, don't be deceived, be careful. He goes on, notice verse 5. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the what? The Christ, and will deceive a few ignorant, naive knuckleheads who aren't paying attention. Many. 
Is that what the Bible says? It says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive what? Many. many. So Jesus, the first two verses, the first two things he says right out of the gate when they ask him about the last days, is he says, take heed that no man deceives you, because many will be deceived. Jump down to verse 11. Jesus speaking. He says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive what? There it is again. We'll deceive many. Jump down to verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will show great signs and wonders to what? Deceive, if possible, even who? Even the elect. Now, here's something very interesting. I have a little Bible program that allows me to type in any word into uh, the, the little search engine there, and it will search how many times does the word deceive or deception occur in the Old Testament, the New Testament, just the Gospel of Matthew, just the Gospel of Luke, whatever. It's a fantastic program. And it's interesting to note that Jesus here uses the word deceive in Matthew chapter 24 more than he does in any other place in the entire New Testament. In other words, Jesus knew that in Matthew chapter 24, where he's addressing issues about the last days, that this idea of deception was a very real and critical issue. Are we all together on that, everyone? Very powerful. The first thing that he says, take heed that no man deceives you, and for three subsequent times, for a total of four, he says, deception, 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 watch out. Now, to me, that communicates to me. I think that Jesus was an excellent communicator. That tells me that deception is a very real danger for people who are living in the last days. Is that what it communicates to you, yes or no? Okay, so far so good. So let's continue on here. According to Jesus, deception, uh, uh, many will be deceived by these false prophets. Not all false prophets work miracles, of course, but apparently those that do are more dangerous and convincing. In fact, I've got to tell you something that is so ridiculous, but I just have to bring it to your attention. Several nights ago, when we presented our message entitled, um, Discover uh, How Near Is The End? And we said, said that there are false Christs and false prophets, and we put up Jim Jones and Marshall Applewhite and some of the others. We put up that man, Dr. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. How many of you remember that? Okay, this guy who's in Miami there claimed to be who? Who does he claim to be? Claims to be the Christ. Did anyone go to the website? You can go to his website and actually watch the interviews with him there on Anderson Cooper 360 Live on CNN. You can watch him on NBC's Today Show. You can watch him on Fox News Live. I mean, the guy literally claims to be Jesus, and he has conservatively 2 million followers, and some would say he says more than 10 million followers. Okay, now here's the amazing thing. They're interviewing him, and uh, Anderson Cooper puts the question to him and says, what would you say to somebody who says you're a false prophet? What would you say to someone who says you're a false messiah, that you're a cult leader? Do you know what he said? He said, Jesus said that false Christs and false prophets would work miracles, and I don't work miracles, therefore I'm not the false. I thought to myself, well, at least he took, at least he went to the first day of class on logic. But Jesus, doesn't, Jesus didn't say that if you don't work miracles, it doesn't mean you're the true Christ. What he's saying is, is that many times people will utilize miracles in order to deceive people. Are you with me, everyone? I mean, I just thought to myself, Lord, have mercy. And I'm not picking on the guy and I'm not picking on his followers. But the reality is, is it goes to show how gullible, how naive, and more important than that, how scripturally illiterate many people are today. Are you with me? I mean, can you just imagine people sitting there. I mean, they show us congregation, nice looking people, good looking people. Uh, the man that basically finances and bankrolls his ministry is a, is a huge multi, multi millionaire web guy. And they show him all sitting there. And can you just imagine them sitting there? And he says, let me prove to you I'm not a false prophet. Let me prove to you I'm not a false messiah. I can't work a miracle. And they all go, wow, it's really him. I mean, it, it's absolute insanity. Are we all together on that, everyone? Now, it doesn't mean that every false Christ and every false prophet will be miracle workers, but clearly someone who worked a supernatural act would be more convincing and more potentially dangerous than those who didn't. Are we all together? Unless they're so smart as this guy as to say, well, that's my proof that I'm really not the false thing is that I can't do it. Absolutely amazing. So notice there on your study guide, false prophets do not announce that they are what? False prophets. False prophets don't just show up and say, hey, listen, by the way, I've got to tell you something. My name is False Prophet. You can get a hold of me at 1-666-Antichrist. That's 1-666-A-N-T-I-Christ. Your local neighborhood false prophet. Now, if that's what false prophets look like, and if they had business cards that read false prophets, we wouldn't have to present presentations like this because how to avoid deception, how to get undeceived, and how to remain undeceived would just be to avoid the guy walking around with the placard on his neck that says, I'm the Antichrist and I'm a deceiver. Right? But the essence of deception and what makes deception so dangerous is that it gets as close to truth as possible without 
being truth. Think of it this way. If I offered you a glass of poison and I said, hey, drink this. You know, you're famished, you're hot. It's a, you know, whoo, I just, I'm so thirsty. And I said, oh, have a nice cold glass of arsenic. Oh, I tell you, it's just, it feels good going down. I mean, the kick is a little much, but you'll love the taste of it. You'd say, what? Are you kidding me? But if I took a nice cold glass of water and I made it look all good with the droplets coming down on the outside and then I put just a single drop of arsenic in it, stirred it up so that you didn't know, he said, oh, I'm thirsty, I just, I'm famished, I need, I need something to drink. And I said, have a nice cold glass of water. Is that more dangerous or less dangerous than the full undiluted arsenic? Far more dangerous because people could actually be tempted to drink that thinking that it's the good thing when in reality they end up dead just the same way. False prophets don't come looking like that. Jesus said that they would actually claim to be the Christ. And many of them, incidentally, are going to be a lot smarter than this Dr. Jose Luis de Miranda. Many people are going to be smarter than that. Now notice this. It goes on to say here, they would be, uh, in fact, they themselves might not even know that they are false prophets. They would be self-deceived. They would be what, everyone? Jesus describes these prophets as wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul even went so far as to say that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of what? Light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14. And no wonder, Paul says, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So, the devil doesn't show up in the red leotards with the pokey tail and the pitchfork saying, I'm the devil, come and follow me. I mean, beloved, do you know who invented that caricature of Satan? He did. He did, because people look at that and think, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, there's no way, impossible, if the devil showed up, if he's going to try and deceive religious people, he's not going to look against religion. He's not going to look anti-religious. He's going to look, what do you think? He's going to look religious. That's exactly right. He, he's going to become religious in order to deceive religious people. That just stands to reason. Jesus said, be, be careful, because the wolves don't come, and come in wolves' clothing. The wolves don't come looking like wolves. If they did, you'd just spy them out immediately. They come looking like what? Sheep. That's exactly right. So now we're right in the middle there of the second page. It says what Revelation says about deception in the last days. The book of Revelation foretells that deception will reach epidemic proportions in the last days. That's what you'd write in there on the blanks. The book of Revelation foretells that deception will reach epidemic proportions in the last days. And let's go look at that together in the book of Revelation. We've got all of those texts there. Let's go look up each one of them. Revelation chapter 12. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. And verse 9. This is a verse we've read before, but let's look at it again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The Bible says, Revelation 12, 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Who deceives the what? The whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So according to that verse, how many would be deceived? The whole world, or at least it appeared that way to John, that basically everybody was wandering after the sophistries of Satan. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14. That's the next one there on your list. It says, And he deceives those. And he what? He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those... What's the next word? Signs. Revelation 13, 14. By those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And you might be looking at that verse thinking, what does that mean? We're going to spend time on this. By the way, those of you who are astute Bible students have already noticed that there are in fact two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. We've only identified the first beast. Who's the second beast that comes up out of the earth that has two horns like a lamb? We're going to spend time on that. The point here is this. Is this. When he goes to deceive, he uses signs and wonders and miracles. I had a young man just the other day say, you know, there's this strange fire in Jerusalem. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's called the Holy Fire. And uh, it just happens once every year. And uh, there's a, uh, they'll, they'll light a candle and, and there'll be a, a fire there. And you can light that, that candle. Uh, you can light a candle from that fire. And it only lasts for like 30 minutes or 33 minutes or something like this. And uh, I went to the website and checked it out. And they show people holding these candles and they, they can put their hands right in the fire. They can hold the fire right to their faces and it doesn't burn. 
They can hold their clothes. It doesn't burn anything. But as soon as the 33 minutes is over, it begins to burn. He said, what do you think of that? I said, well, I don't know what I think of it. I said, let me, let me ask you a question. When Moses, do I believe that that could be true? Of course I believe that could be true. I mean, to say that it couldn't be true would be to set yourself up for even greater deception. I don't know if it is or if it isn't. It may be a hoax, but here's the point. If it's not a hoax, that is not proof that it's from God. Moses went there into Pharaoh's court. God had told him what to do. He said, hey, when Pharaoh says, who, you know, who sent you? He said, take your staff and do what? Throw it down and it would become a snake. Okay, so Pharaoh goes in there and says, hey, let my people go. Well, why should I let your, uh, these people go? Who is this God? I don't know who this God is. And so he said, ah, I'll show you. Boom. He throws the staff down. It becomes a snake. Well, what did the magicians of Pharaoh do? Yeah, they did the same thing. They threw down their staffs and says, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. We, we have snakes too. Beloved, that tells me that the devil can work miracles. In fact, you're right there in Revelation. This one's not on your, your, your uh, page there, but look at Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16, this is during the sixth plague, okay? The sixth plague. Revelation chapter 16. Notice with me verse 12. You might want to write this one down because it's not there in your notes. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We might spend some time on this. Verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits, like what? Frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There's the false trinity right there, by the way. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But notice verse 14. They are the spirits of what? demons performing what? Signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to do what? Gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, And they gather them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now you might be wondering, Whoo, when is that? You know, when is that Armageddon battle? And, and who are these three uh, uh, unclean frogs that come out? You know, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the point. We will spend some time on that if the Lord allows us time. Here's what I want you to see is that they use miracles to gather people. Do you see that? Yes or no? That agrees perfectly with Revelation chapter 13 that miracles, signs, and wonders would be used. So beloved, does God still work miracles today? Yes or no? Listen, God worked an actual, bona fide, non-negotiable, inarguable, unequivocal miracle in my life. I had been a Christian for four months. Many of my non-Christian friends said he's been brainwashed. And I used to say to them when they'd say that, my brain could use a good washing. Amen? They say, oh, he's been brainwashed, and, and oh, David, he's lost his mind, and blah, blah, blah. And many of my friends, because I came from a very interesting community. I came from the punk rock community. My hair was purple, blue, red, hair, orange, long hair, no hair, dreadlock hair, tattoos all over me. That was my community. And when I became a religious person, I had committed the highest form of treason. You could have been anything in the community I was in. You could have been a transvestite. You could have been a child molester. You could have been anything. But to become a Christian was to become the worst of all in my community. So I became a Christian and all my friends totally disowned me. I went from having lots of friends, or at least what I thought were friends, to having basically no friends overnight. And uh, something happened. I was out rock climbing with one of the few friends that would still spend a little time with me. His, his name was Luke. And uh, I was up rock climbing and I was doing actually a maneuver called a heel hook, which, which I don't recommend unless you know rock climbing. But anyway, I was trying to pull over the top of this rock and you hook your heel up just like that, right? And you, help, you use your heel to help pull over. You might be thinking, is he really doing that on the pulpit? Yeah, I'm really doing it. So I was trying to pull myself up over. And what happened is it had rained the day before and there was a little water down in the pocket. And so when I reached up to grab that little handhold, guess what happened? I slip. So as I slip, I'm coming off the rock like this. I was about 20 feet in the air, no ropes. Okay? I was doing what's called bouldering. And I come down like this, and there's a great big triangular pyramid-shaped rock right below me. Bad choice. Okay? It, normally, it would have been a very easy thing for me to do, but I had forgotten about the rain, and there was water in that pocket. So I come shooting off this thing like a rubber band. I'm looking at that rock, and uh, I try to step over the rock, but I catch my toe right here, the tip of my toe on the tip of that rock. And when I fall down, I fall down just like that. And guess what happened to my leg? broke it for the third time, right? I've broken my right ankle three times because before that I was trying my lot as a professional skateboarder, okay? I've done many things. Here's the point. My leg broke and I knew it. I knew it immediately, okay? So here's what happened. My two buddies, Luke and Travis, they put one arm around this side, one arm on this side. They take me into town and uh, 
I called up the, the person that I was working for. I was actually working at a vegetarian restaurant because I was taking time off of medical school trying to decide what God wanted me to do with my life. So I called her up and I said, hey, listen, I'm not going to be able to come to work tomorrow. Why not? She said, well, um, uh, she, I, she said, uh, pardon me, I said, I'm not going to be able to come to work. And she said, why not? And I said, I broke my leg again. I broke my ankle. She said, well, I've got this doctor over here and, and we'll provide him some free meals because I didn't have medical insurance. We'll provide him some free meals. Go up there, get an x-ray and get it taken care of. So I went up there to Dr. Gary's office. I go into Dr. Gary's office. Sure enough, he x-rays me and I says, you know, third time he broke it. It's a hairline fracture. Can see it. My ankle is all swollen up, swollen up, big purple and black and blue. And so now I was on crutches. Went down to Rushmore Medical Supply there. I was from Rapid City, South Dakota. Got myself some crutches. The lady said, oh, that ankle looks terrible. I said, yeah, it looks really bad. I went hobbling out of there. Went home. I said, Mom, look what happened to my ankle. Oh, no, third time. Okay, here's the point. I knelt down that night and I said, God, I'm sorry. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I should not have been climbing under those circumstances. I should have known better. Please forgive me. And I was, frankly, chiefly concerned that the restaurant that I was working at was not going to have enough help because there were only four of us that helped her. And I knew she was basically going to be in trouble because I couldn't chop carrots and do all the things I needed to do while I was on these crutches. So I said, God, please forgive me for the mistake I made. If it could be possible, please, by your grace, heal my ankle. I just ask. I said, if, if that's possible, if there's some way in your plan that you could forgive me for this thing, I see that I've done wrong. And so I went to bed that night, and the next morning I just had this voice, this, this, this sense that said, hop out of bed. Hop out of bed on a broken ankle, right? And uh, I had one of these air casts on where your toes still stick out the front, and I, so I, I just hopped out of bed. And I began to flex up on my toes, and I felt there was no pain. I began to jump around, and, and then I started to jump around on my broken foot. And I, Woo, praise the Lord. And I grabbed my crutches, and I ran upstairs. I said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. My mom's a certified nurse. And I said, Mom, look at this. <laughs> my ankles are... She's like, ah, it's just adrenaline. It's just adrenaline. You know, get back on your crutches. I said, no, Mom, the Lord Jesus healed me. Well, anyway, so then I went back. I actually literally grabbed my crutches. I was on my way to work. And uh, I stopped by the very Rushmore Medical Supply store the day before I had gotten my crutches at. And just to the glory of God, because I've gotten them the day before at about 5 o'clock, and that was early in the morning, about 9 o'clock, just to the glory of God, the same lady was working. I walk in. She's like, what are you doing in here? I said, God healed my ankle. I said, I just became a Christian four months ago, and, and look at this. <laughs> I started hopping around, and she's like, ah! She said, you've got a twin. You know, it's not really you. And I said, no. And I, I pulled up uh, my, my, my uh, sock there, pulled down my sock, pulled up my pants to show her, and it was still very black and blue, but no swelling. And I'm hopping around, you know, woo, like a kangaroo. She couldn't believe it. So I go to the, the place where I'm working at. There was a vegetarian restaurant called Veggie's. And uh, the, the woman who owned it, Mary, she's the one that I'd called the day before and said I can't make it. She was a woman of such incredible prayer. I mean, she'd say, Lord Jesus, we need a new refrigerator. And like we'd open our eyes and there'd be a new refrigerator there. I mean, not exactly, but I mean, she, God answers her prayers. I mean, I feel like she has a, some sort of special access VIP pass. Sometimes I go to these airports, you know, and, and the, the people who travel a lot get to go in the red carpet room. And I feel like she has that sometimes with the Lord. Like she'd pray and boom, the Lord would answer a prayer right in front of our eyes. And so, you know, I'm on fire because God has healed my ankle. You know, four-month Christian, I'm on fire, and I come walking in. And she's there cutting the carrots, you know, and doing her thing. I'm like, Mary, Mary, God healed my ankle. And I'll never forget, she was totally unfazed. She's like, yeah, I thought he might do that. Now get to chopping the radishes. <laughs> I was like, I mean, literally, she was totally unfazed. She expected it. She, to her, that was like everyday life. Of course he healed your ankle. I need you in here. Now get to work, boy. I, mean, I couldn't believe it. Beloved, does God still work miracles? Yeah. yeah, sure he works miracles. And by the way, healing a broken ankle is nothing compared to healing a broken heart. Yeah. And every one of us suffers from a broken heart. Every one of us has a terrible cancer, worse than Ebola, worse than AIDS, worse than the bird flu, worse than any of those diseases you can imagine. It's called the cancer of sin. And the most amazing miracle that God can work is to save someone and to get them to hate their sin and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. But that doesn't mean that every miracle is from God. And that's the point. That's the point. The devil were Listen. The devil is no dummy. He knows. He knows that most people spend way more time watching the game, way more time watching the television, way more time watching the computer, way more time doing anything and everything but reading the Bible. And so he knows that if he presents a miracle and he puts a little, uh, you know, he presents some sort of a miracle, puts a little Christian brush on it, most of the Christian people who are spending very little time, not to mention the non-Christian people, of course, they're going to be duped immediately, but the Christian people are spending very little time in their Bibles. They're just going, ooh, miracle. 
Whoa, this is from God. And look, there's 20,000 people here who also think it's from God. No, no, no. Just because a miracle has worked doesn't mean it's from God. Are we clear? So you're still there in Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. It says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked what? Signs. Do you see that? Worked sign in his presence by which he what? Deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. They were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. So notice, deception is actually going to play a role in people receiving the mark of the beast. And there's all kinds of crazy ideas out there about what the mark of the beast is. I'm going to show you directly from the Bible. From the what, everyone? From the Bible, exactly what the mark of the beast is. You don't have to be afraid of some computer in Belgium or that you got a social security number. You, listen, don't worry about your license plate if it happens to have 666 on it. I'll show you from the Bible what the mark of the beast is. Does that sound like a good idea, yes or no? But here's the point. Many people are going to be led to receive the mark of the beast because they'll be deceived by miracles. So far, so good? In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, you can read on your own. Notice what it says. The dragon uses what? Deception. It is the hallmark of his plans and strategies. He used it on the heavenly angels. He used it on Eve and Eden. And today, no surprise, he continues to employ deception. In fact, his deceptive power will only what? Increase as we near the end of time. Paul shared Jesus' concern and warning against widespread deception just before Jesus returns. Open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul shared Jesus' concern. Look, look at what we're hearing. Jesus says, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. Revelation says there's going to be deception, 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 miracles, deceit. And Paul says the very same thing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We spent some time in here last night looking at he who restrains until he's taken out of the way, etc. That's the passage we're going to, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm just going to read it through, okay? And I've given you several blanks you can fill in there. See if you can fill in the blanks as we go. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Even if you get a letter that's signed Paul, even if a spirit appears to you, even if an angel appears to you, he says, don't be deceived because something has to happen first. Don't believe that the day of Christ has come because something else has to happen first. Verse 3, let no one what? Deceive, deceive you, just like Jesus. Paul says, hey, in the last days, be careful of? Deception. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, the second coming of Jesus, will not come until a, what comes first? A falling away. And the word falling away, what does it mean in the Greek? A divorce, that's right. Until the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, talking of the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, verse 4, or that is worshipped. Remember, worship at the end is the issue. So that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now think about it. If he's showing himself that he's God, clearly he's a religious figure. Is, am I the only person in the world that that makes sense to? I mean, could an, could an antagonistic religious figure go into the temple of God and say, I'm God, and deceive anyone? Paul was smarter than that. Jesus was smarter than that. I mean, come on, they're not going to say, oh yeah, when this guy comes on the scene that clearly hates Jesus, is antagonistic to Jesus, defies Jesus, and stands against Jesus, and overtly opposes Jesus, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. I wouldn't even give the guy one second. The problem here is that this guy goes into the temple of God pretending that he is God. Oh, and by the way, he's working miracles. So he even looks like he's God's representative on earth. Paul says, don't be deceived. Verse 5, do you not remember when I was with you that I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. We talked about that last night. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness. By the way, I just want to say something here very quickly. Some people say, well, why did Satan sin? I don't understand that. Why did Satan sin in the first place? I'm confused. How does a perfect being in a perfect environment with a perfect God and a perfect creator sin? Notice it calls it the mystery of lawlessness. Quick question for you. Is a mystery something you do know or don't know? You don't know. Beloved, you cannot explain the origin of sin. If sin could be explained, it could be excused. If you could give a reason for sin, then you could give a justification for sin. 
It's the mystery of lawlessness. Don't ask me how he did it or why he did it. I'll ask God when I get to heaven. I don't even know if God knows. It's a total mystery. How, how does it happen? We don't know. The mystery of lawlessness. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Whom the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth and consume with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan. Satan. And notice verse 9. With all power and signs and what else? Lying wonders. So he's using clearly miracles and supernatural things. Verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception. There's the word among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Beloved, according to that passage, if, the, if all you knew was that passage, what is the cure for deception? Truth. And not just a truth, but what does it say? The love of the truth. Okay, now you can go fill in those blanks there. Paul was concerned about, number one, the day of the Lord's return. Number two, the deception of the man of sin and Satan himself. So number one, the day of the Lord's return. Number two, the deception of the man of sin and Satan himself. Number three, the rejection of truth and the embracing of lies, lying wonders. And number four, the deceitful nature of both sin and Satan. Jesus was concerned about deception. Paul was concerned about deception. We should be concerned about deception. And oh, please, Christian person, oh, please, believer, don't sit there and say, whoo-wee, I'm glad he's not talking about me because I'm undeceived. Because as we said again, that is exactly how deceived people think. Is that clear, everyone? Okay, let's continue on here. Jesus, Paul, and John in the book of Revelation make it clear that miracles, signs, and wonders will be employed by who, everyone? Satan to deceive. But it gets even worse. Notice that. My own heart betrays me? That's the next study guide headline there. According to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, what is the most deceitful of all things? Here it is. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is what? Deceitful above all all things and desperately wicked who can know it. You think, oh, I wonder who that's talking about. That must be talking about Saddam Hussein. That must be talking about Osama bin Laden. Do you know whose heart that's talking about? Yours. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, so much so who can know it. Now notice this. Perhaps the most dangerous kind of deception is self-deception. Self-deception. I'm going to give you four verses here very quickly. Write them down. Here's the first one. Perhaps the most dangerous kind of deception is self-deception. Here you go. Number one. James chapter 1, verse 22. That's the first one. But be doers of the word. Of the what? The word. And not hearers only. What are the next two words? Deceiving what? According to that verse, can you deceive yourself? Second verse. Verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is what? How many people here think they're religious? Raise your hand. I think I'm a religious person. Why not? I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I would consider myself to be a religious person. But notice what he says. If any of you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his what? In other words, you can't control your mouth, but deceives his what? His own heart. This one's religion is useless. James wasn't against religion, but he was against useless religion. According to these two verses here, is it possible to deceive yourself? Absolutely. Notice this one. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, what does he do? He deceives himself. Galatians 6.3. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 3.18. Let no one deceive himself. Why does he say that, let no one deceive himself? Because that's Satan's job. <laughs> He's basically saying, don't do the devil's job for him. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a... Fool that he may be wise. Now we could go look at all of these texts in context and see what they're actually teaching, but the broader point is this. Self-deception is a very potent reality. You can deceive yourself. In fact, if you want to see the most powerful chapter in the entire Bible on self-deception, does anyone know what chapter that would be? The most powerful chapter, how people literally trick themselves into believing what is a lie. Romans chapter 1. Go read it today in the afternoon. You will not find a more powerful chapter than Romans chapter 1 that describes how people can literally deceive themselves. Absolutely amazing. So notice this here on the study guide. It says this is very important and an often overlooked point. 
The heart is steeped in what? Sin and selfishness. And thus it longs to accept that which accommodates and caters to its unregenerate nature. In other words, the heart is looking to be deceived. The unconverted heart loves to hear that which flatters it. It is almost as though our heart wants to be deceived and lied to. This is especially true if the lie that we are told frees our heart and mind to indulge in unrighteous pleasure and sin. Isn't that true? That, that's why, you know, the preachers that say, some people say, oh, that was a fire and brimstone sermon. Beloved, listen to me. A fire and brimstone sermon is not what you think of traditionally as a fire and brimstone sermon. A fire and brimstone sermon is a sermon that sounds like this. Oh, don't worry. It's okay. Everything's fine. I mean, don't worry, about, don't worry about changing. Don't worry about getting victory over sins. Don't worry about all those things. I mean, God accepts you. Is it true that God accepts you just as the way you are? Of course, He receives you as you are, but He wants to change you and transform you and give you victory and, and make you the person that you can be in Christ. Amen? Amen? So the true fire and brimstone sermon is the preacher that stands up and says, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine because that sermon is going to get someone in fire and brimstone. See, the heart longs to believe that which says, oh, really? Oh, oh, really? So now I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, and because I'm fully free and forgiven, I can go do whatever I want. Because Jesus is my Savior, I can live like the devil? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. The cure for deception. Here it is. The cure for the deceptions that abound in this age. The... Bible. You've got it. The Bible is the elixir for deception, the cure for deception. It alone can free us from the deceptions, the dece deceptions, power, and influence. Think, for example, of Eve in the Garden of Eden. How different would things have been if Eve, like Jesus in the wilderness, had stood on a plain, thus saith the Lord. And it is written. Now think about it. Let's go to that experience there. Eve's, Eve stumbles upon the tree, and there's the serpent. He was crafty. He was clever. He says, hey, hey, I got a question for you. I mean, has God really said, I mean, God is keeping something from you, isn't he? Has God really said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? She wanted that fruit. Didn't she want it? And now she's thinking, oh, really? Hmm, interesting. Well, God, God has said we, we can't eat of it, neither can we touch it. He says, hey, listen, it's good for you. In fact, if you eat it, you'll become as God's knowing good and evil. Now her heart wants it. She wants it, and she's been deceived, and she's easily deceived because the devil has tricked her into wanting something that God knows is not for her best good. He say amen? That's the danger. See, our hearts are naturally going to gravitate toward things that sound pleasing to the ears. But, beloved, we need to not test things by how nice they sound, but how do they sound in comparison to the Word of God. Amen? amen. That's the point. That's the point. The only cure for deception is... God's Word. So let's continue on here. Eve should have trusted the Word of God. It could have immediately dispelled the darkness of Satan's power. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, Jesus is referred to as the Logos, that is the Word. You know that verse. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now consider the following texts that equate truth with God's Word. So Jesus is the Word. Who's the Word, everyone? Jesus. Now, Jesus was speaking on one occasion, and He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus was the Word, and He was the truth. Amen? John chapter 17, verse 17. Take a look at that. I could just quote it for you, but I want you to see it in your own Bible. John 17, verse 17. Notice this. Powerful. John 17, verse 17. Jesus speaking. He says, Sanctify them by your truth. Sanctify them by your what? Truth. truth. Your Word is what? Truth. And there's two other verses there you can look up on your own. Your word is truth. In fact, if you want to write down a verse, write this down very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Just write that down. Scribble that down somewhere. 1 Timothy 3, 15. Here the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, he calls the church the pillar and ground of truth. The pillar and ground of what? Truth. truth. Now, we said this the other day, but it bears repeating. Beloved, we don't find a church that suits us and then hope they preach the truth. What we do is we find the truth and then we go find a church that's preaching what's true. Can you say amen? amen. I mean, people choose churches today for so, some of the foolish, most insanely ridiculous reasons. Well, I like the choir and I like the organ and my grandmother went here and I like the donuts after church and what in the... 
what do you think you're talking about? You're not talking about Elks Club. You're not talking about the Rotary. You're talking about eternal truth. <laughs> it's more than the donuts, amen? It's more than the children's program. I'd rather worship under an oak tree, according to God's Word, than in the most beautifully ornate cathedral with the best music and all of the accoutrements if I was following error. Uh, yes or no? Yes. By the way, Jesus himself had to change churches, didn't he? He began his ministry. He said, take these things out of here. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. But at the end of his three and a half years of ministry, he said, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus didn't want to leave that church, but when they rejected truth, he had no choice because he was the truth. Amen? Whoo, you're getting me fired up. Last page. Here we go. Last page, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is what? Living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It can pierce to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and it can discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There it is. The heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So what can guide our heart that is prone to deception, that is prone to lying wonders, that is prone to errors? We need something that can rein our heart in and keep it on the straight and narrow. And the only thing that can do that is the Word of God. Amen? Notice, it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you ever just been reading the Bible and uh, you're just reading, you know, just sit down for a nice morning devotion and all of a sudden, boom, God drops a bomb and you think, wow, I, how did he do that? I feel like this whole verse was written and preserved down through 2,000 years of human history just to speak to me on this morning. Anyone ever had that experience? Beloved, God speaks through his word. But if you're not spending time in the word, if you're spending more time in front of the television or at the sports arena or wherever, you're setting yourself up for deception. Deception. So we're on the last page there. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus returns and a sharp sword goes out of his mouth. What's that sharp sword? It doesn't mean he literally has a sword. It's the word of God in his mouth. So we're at the top of the paragraph there. Here's a couple, here's a couple words for you to love and learn. Elucidation or obfuscation. Hmm. You say, what does that mean? Elucidation means to make light or what? Clear. clear. Obfuscation means the exact opposite. That is to darken or obscure. The Bible, especially prophecy, is sent to enlighten that which is what? Dark. We've already seen in 2 Peter chapter 1 where it says that the Word of God is like a light that shines in a dark place. Isaiah 60 is the same. The 1,260 years extending from 538 A.D. to 1798 that we have already spoken of are commonly referred to as the what ages? The dark ages. The reason they were dark, among others, is that the Word of God, God's lamp and God's light, was nearly extinguished by the Roman church state. I've quoted there for you Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A recent Barna report said that 90% of American homes have at least one Bible. 90% of American homes have at least one Bible. That is to say that it's sitting there in its token fashion right next to the porcelain blue jay. One day uh, C. S., uh, Spurgeon was preaching to his church there in, in London and he said, many of you have enough dust on your Bibles that you could write the word condemnation in it. Interesting, isn't it? Something to think about. There was a time when being a Christian meant something. There was a time when being a Christian meant more than having the little fish on the back of your Honda Accord. Did you know that? There was a time when if you stood for Christ, that was the last thing you would ever do. You can read that book right there, Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you don't believe what I'm telling you. That's one of the most powerful books you will ever read. Stories of, of men and women standing for truth under the most severe persecution. I mean, grotesque things, things that are so ugly and repulsive that I wouldn't even mention them in a church service like this. I mean, grotesque things that were done to people for why? Standing for God and standing for His truth. Terrible. William Tyndale, in October of 1536, was killed. He was martyred under the King of England's decree by the Roman church state. It was the Roman church state who said, kill that man. Do you know what William Tyndale's crime was? He translated the Bible into English. That was his crime. His last words were, Oh God, open the eyes of the king of England. And they strangled him to death and then they burned his body. Beloved, that book you have in your hand right there, that's a blood-bought book. 
Thousands of men and women down through the ages shed their blood so that you could have that Bible. Today we have every kind of Bible you can imagine. Today we have the women's devotional Bible and the men's devotional Bible and the African American devotional Bible and the gay and lesbian study Bible. I mean, every kind of study Bible. We got every Bible for every person, but so few people are reading their Bibles. Are you hearing me? Very few people actually sitting down to read. Beloved, William Tyndale and hundreds of others, thousands of others, those, those pages in that book are stained with blood. Those people said, we've got to let people have the truth. Why? Because the Bible had been locked up in, other, in, a, in a language that the common people didn't understand. It was chained to monastery walls. It was chained to temple walls in the Latin language, which the common person couldn't understand. And people like Tyndale and others, Huss and Jerome said, no, 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 no. We've got to get this out into the common circulation. People need to see that the Roman church state is leading people astray. If they can just get the word for themselves, they'll have the cure for the deceptions of the Antichrist. Powerful. There was a time when being a Christian really did mean something. There was a time when it was illegal to own a Bible. You were caught with that book in your hands, you, you could be stoned or burned or far worse. This here is a picture of a Waldensian museum in the northern valleys, valleys of Italy. This was a group of people, the Waldensians in the Piedmont valleys there, that would, that would take uh, uh, sitting down at coffee tables and they would, uh, not coffee, but coffee tables, and they would write uh, sections of scripture and they would go into town as merchants and, and sell merch, uh, goods and other articles and things and give them little pieces of scripture. To, they were trying to get it out, trying to get the word out in those dark, dark ages. And sure enough, in the providence of God, in 1455, a man by the name of Gutenberg printed the Bible. It was the first book ever printed. I mean, it was just like God was, God's timing is impeccable. Just as the printing press, because prior to that, Bibles were very expensive. Because you had to pay somebody to hand write it out. I mean, it was extremely expensive. Only the most elite and the wealthiest could own a Bible. But here a man named Gutenberg invents this thing called the printing press. The first book that was ever printed on a printing press was the New Testament. Second book was the Old Testament. And the Bible begins to go like wildfire at the very same time that it's getting translated into the common languages, English and German and other languages. That was not just a coincidence. God knew that just as the translations were coming, there needed to be a quick, rapid way to get those things out there. And it's no coincidence that it was invented right right on time, and that the first book ever published on a printing press was the Bible. Ha, powerful, beloved. Martin Luther, in his defense before the council at Worms on April 7, 1521, he was the, the monk who had discovered, he had discovered the great truths of Scripture and he began to reject the pomposity of the papacy. He began to reject all of the accoutrements and paraphernalia of this huge religious establishment. And he, he saw four words, the just shall live by faith. The just live by faith. He saw those four words. It changed everything. Those four words changed the world, beloved. And he was standing there before the Council of Worms. Martin Luther would later say in his diary, he thought he was walking into that room. It would be the last thing he ever did. And this is what he said. You've heard this probably before, some of you. Unless I shall be convinced, because they said, Re retract. Take it all back. It's all lies. Take it back and bow to the authority of the Pope. Bow to the authority of the church. He said, listen, unless I shall be convinced by the testimonies of the what? the scriptures, or by clear reason, I neither can nor will make any retraction, since it is neither safe nor honorable to act against what? Conscience. And then he said, God help me. And he walked out. God miraculously preserved Martin Luther. He didn't die a martyr's death. He died in his old age. God preserved him. Beloved, we need that kind of boldness, that kind of courage today. Amen? Amen. Whoo, I tell you. The four essential questions of life. Where am I from? origin. Why am I here? Meaning. How should I live? Morality. And where am I going? Destiny. The Bible has the answers to those questions. The Bible has the answers to those questions. Paul said, notice it right there in your study guide, 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax what? It'll get better and better at the end of time. What does it say? Worse and worse. And what will they do? Deceiving and being deceived. Deception would reach epidemic proportions, colossal, colossal monumental proportions just before the end of time. So then how do we do it? It's very simple. And everything hinges on the word. You want to get undeceived? You want to remain undeceived? It's actually very simple. You got to read the word. Amen? You got to read it. 
It's good to come to these seminars. I'm thrilled you're coming to these presentations. Listen, praise the Lord Jesus. If you were presenting and you were preaching what I'm preaching, I'd be sitting where you're sitting. I promise. Uh, it's not about the man. It's about the message. Amen? Amen? So it's good to come to things like this, but you have to spend some of your own time reading the Bible. Amen. Number two, you've got to study the Bible. You say, well, I thought you just said that. There's a big difference between reading and studying. Amen. Isn't that true? I learned that in anatomy. You can read the anatomy textbook, but you get, a, you get a D or a C on the test. You want to get an A on the test, what do you got to do? You got to study it. Okay? There's a big difference between reading and studying. And what we're doing in these presentations is I don't just stand up and start reading. We're studying. Okay? And it's one thing to study in a group. And praise the Lord Jesus for that. But you also need to learn how to study on your own. Some people don't know how to study the Bible. Well, you keep coming and we'll give you the tools to teach you how to do it for yourself. Amen? Amen. Number three, believe the Word. Believe it. It's true. It's absolutely true. I wish I had time to go into why I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. and give you many evidences, many reasons. Number four, obey it. Amen? Amen. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be stubborn. If you see something that's in the Bible, and it plainly is in the Bible, even if it's different than what you used to believe, even if it's new from what you used to believe, if it's in the words, if it's in black and white or red and white, believe it and obey it. Amen? Amen? He said, oh, I can't, make a, I can't make a break. I can't make a break from what I've always believed. I had a young man say to me just the other day, how could I ever, how could I ever become a member of your church? I didn't ask him to become a member of my church. I never even mentioned anything about my church. He said, how could I become a member of your church and leave this church that I was born up in and raised in and my whole culture surrounds this church? I said, hey, listen, you are, we'll, we'll just call him for the sake of purposes, we'll call him a Macedonian. Okay, I'll say, hey, listen, you are a Macedonian. But before you were a Macedonian, you were a child of God. And there is, a heart, there is a stronger call on your life than the Macedonian call. There's a stronger call on your life than your parents' call, than your cultural call. God knew you and made you and formed you before you were any of those things. And so your first responsibility is to God. Amen. Before you were black, before you were white, before you were Jamaican, before you were Macedonian, before you were whatever, you were God's. Amen. Okay? And so if God says, hey, I want you to do A, He'll give you the strength to do it. Sometimes it can be hard to change. Amen? I mean, listen, we're creatures of habit. We hate change. But if we're changing for the Lord Jesus Christ, He can give us the strength. And I'm going to go a step further. He can make it enjoyable. Amen. Even when our friends are abandoning us and our family says, listen, when I dropped out of medical school, and it's not that I dropped out in the sense, but when I dropped out of studying medicine, my dad went insane. I was studying at the University of Wyoming, which was his alma mater. I mean, my dad thought I had lost my mind. All of my friends said, no way. He's been brainwashed. We're done with him. And I, I literally felt like I was alone. I had nothing. And a young friend of mine came to my house and I asked him if he wanted to study the Bible. And he said, yeah, I'd be interested in studying the Bible. And that Sunday we studied the Bible for eight hours. The next Sunday we studied the Bible for eight hours. The next Sunday we studied the Bible for eight hours. Two weeks later he was baptized. His name is Nathan Renner. He's the young man that introduces me every night. He say amen? One of my best friends in the world, one of my best friends in the world is now my senior pastor. Can you say amen? amen. See, li listen. I would have never had the experience that I'm having today. I mean, listen, no one in this room has a better life than me. No one in this room loves life more than I do. You could love it as much as I do, but not more than I do, because I'm, I'm in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done in my life. Amen? But what if I would have been afraid? Oh, I, I, I can't do it. I just go back to what's comfortable. Uh, I just can't do it. I'll go back to what's, what's, what I've always done, what's normal. No, 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 no. Beloved, if God is calling you to do something new, it's because He's calling you to something great. Amen? So believe it, obey it, share it.